what? No, so this piece is dedicated to the babies I've lost, and in particular to my son, Tapio. Part one, beating hearts. First pregnancy. I'm afraid there's no heart beat, says the sonographer, but I was carrying twins. Two heartbeats missing, and mine. Three heartbeats, a trio in harmony. My heart misses a beat. No, wait, missing two beats. Miscarriage at 11 weeks, but it's not that easy. The body refuses to give up. Frozen, it holds on, I hold on, until the pain overcomes and I'm back in hospital again. Could not sign the consent form. Felt like I was signing my life away. It was all down to me and only me. Long protective decision, an alien world, a different language, so far from home and yet at home. Nature refusing to take its course, vacuuming my inside. I failed <clears throat> at sustaining life and I failed at letting go naturally. I'm scared, scared for myself. Scared of going under, of the darkness, of what's to come. Part two, Shattered World. I felt I'd recovered well. On my first child, a little girl aged three, and I was pregnant again. Only one heartbeat this time. I was happy. Today, we're going to find out the sex, joy, trepidation, anticipation, it's a boy, the sonographer says. Wandering mind, baby boy. First steps, boy clothes, haircuts, school bag, scooter, first fall, first cuts, growth spur, teenage boy, Adam apple, young man, father. And then silence, long silence. It's something with the brain, she said. Ambivalence, hope, and despair. Oops. <laughs> Limbo, part three. Eight weeks of nightmare. Blood tests, scans, noisy MRIs, embodied emotions, adrenaline, cortisol, shaping his brain. Oscillation, improving and worsening, trying to keep up with the natural growth of a baby's brain. Ambivalence, attachment and detachment, wanting more time, wanting less time, time with him, time in hope, time running out, decision to make, a surface choice, but not before I could make sense in my own language, so I could really know. C'est pas beau du tout, said the French consultant of what he saw on the screen. Ce n'est pas bon. And so the decision is made to terminate the life of our baby boy before he was born. I stuck his heartbeat because I loved him. Part four, Guardian. Felt so tired, heavy, sluggish, empty, and relieved to no longer suffer, at least not in the same way. Different sufferings, longing for the weight of him in my tummy, loss of him, of potential, of innocence, anger at us, his parents, for not wanting him enough, at others, having living babies, oscillation between grief and restoration, and a lonely place to be, keeping the balance, guardian of his memory, guardian of the family, saying enough, but not too much, not projecting, not transferring onto a new pregnancy, onto another child. But somehow, the delicate, durable shift, new directions, self-discovery, connection to others, 
sense of purpose, yet always with me, part of me, never forgotten, especially you, that's you. So today, as I transition to a different stage of my life, no longer being of reproductive age, I take stock, stock of the babies that I've lost. These truly intimate experiences set in motion an enduring transformation in many aspects of my life, not dissimilar to what's described in the psychological literature as post-traumatic growth. Over the many years I've taught reproductive health, I've conducted research in the area of traumatic perinatal loss, I've written and spoken about the strengths, the courage and spirits many individuals display when facing such experiences. I've also become increasingly aware that I would have at some point to revisit my own experience and understand how it fits within the research I've conducted, the individual I've befriended, and my own development. So today is my first step into my autoethnographic journey. It is also my first attempt at reconciling these different aspects of my experience and at moving to a different way of grieving the loss of my babies, I mean, really particularly the loss of my son. And it's taken me 16 years. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so um, my session today, it's called um, Pictures, Poetry and a Playlist, Compositions of Experience. And I'm going to use this session to share how I've used those um, to help create things from my research. Um, so my, my research um, uses auto slash biography to explore how women describe their experiences being a mother of autistic children. And I had research conversations with 30 mothers, which provided a wealth of rich and very, very personal stories. People shared things that I was really surprised that they shared, but obviously demonstrated kind of that, that kind of level equal relationship that we had. Um, this paper kind of celebrates my subjective lived experience as the mother of two autistic children, but also as a researcher and how I intuitively and creatively engage with my data to try and bring something out of my respondents, my participants, my um, collaborators' stories. And I called these compositions of their experience because I created poetry, collages, and a playlist. Um, and uh, I've, I have tweeted the link to the playlist if anybody wants to see the full playlist, but I'll share some of those things as we go through. So I initially intended to use thematic analysis. I was talking to someone about this earlier um, from my interview data, but it was just hugely overwhelming. And I didn't really feel it did it justice. I felt like I missed so much out of it. So um, there was too many words, there was too much noise, and I just felt I was doing everything wrong and had a bit of a slight crisis. So I started looking at um, voice-centered approaches and using relational methods and um, using the listening guide. So I was really listening to the women's stories in much more depth. Um, and so when I was using the voice centered approach, I think the first thing I started to do was I started to create I poems and then I felt that they weren't quite enough. So I produced what I've called bio poems, which basically are biographical poems, which are adapt basically adapted the process of making I poems. So I still take the I, me, we, you statements, but then I also take other things that felt significant. So obviously that was the bit that was intuitive in terms of which bits that I chose to pull out. Um, the bio poems helped me massively to engage with the data, um, but it didn't solve all my problems. So um, I was chatting to Sherilyn, who's in the next session, over there, thank you. Um, at a writing retreat, and I and she was using she'd used some collage in her data, and um, I thought I might try combining using collage and pictures with using the voice centered approach that I'd already adopted, and um, I found into when I would go through the poems, there was sometimes there'd be pictures that just kind of sprung into my mind, and so that helped me then to start thinking about what. I might want to use as I went through. And some of it is literal, um, some of it slightly more abstract. So the playlist, I started to build in a playlist because also songs would occasionally come to my mind that reminded me of things, but it also came from my own 
um, experience. And um, there's a song that like really is really pertinent to my experience of mothering an autistic child and it's True Colours and I'm afraid it's the Trolls version. It's not even the cool Cindy Lauper version, which frustrates me. And I did think I could switch it, but actually I can't because it just doesn't do it justice. Because when my son was first excluded from school when he was six, he loved the Trolls and so this, he used to watch the Trolls movie. And so I just remember sitting, listening to this one time. And um, yeah, I sat in the back of the car and I was really listening to the words of that song. And I'm shocked, I'm sorry to say that now if I watch the Trolls movie, I will be in tears. And um, yes, yeah, so it's a bit, um, it's a bit of an interesting one, but I thought it actually really connects people to this, these stories in a way that people can relate to. Um, and for me, like the listening to the lyrics of True Colours, I kind of reflected that he was so small and he was sad and traumatised and his school couldn't see his true colours behind his difficult behaviours and meltdowns that happened as a result of the anxiety he was feeling. And I just think, you with the sad eyes, don't be discouraged, I realise. It's hard to take courage in a world of sort of people. You can lose sight of it all. The darkness inside you can make you feel so small. I'm going to share some extracts of the poems. Um, and I've also put the name of the song that goes with the, thank you, that goes with that particular piece. Now, I will say that sometimes the titles of the songs um, might be literal, but the words are really important. So there'll never be, there'll never be a song where the lyrics don't have some meaning. So it's not just about the title. It was always on my radar. I used to have really bad anxiety about the prospect of having a child with autism, media and society's perception, my family's as well. In my head, autism was just a looming monster. I was already hyper aware. We were doing the same thing we do every single day. I get him out of his bed. We walk down the stairs. I talk through the pictures, everything we'd done normally. He'd just forgotten it all. I had no way to connect with him anymore. He'd gone. Him as a human being was there, his personality was there, how we were aware, how we were as other human beings was almost pointless. I could tell that wasn't right. It can be extremely upsetting. One of the parents invited the whole class apart from Jacob. They did a really good job of us not knowing. You didn't know about it. Were you not invited? No, we weren't. That's actually a horrible thing to do. If you're going to invite the whole class, it's actually pretty horrible to exclude somebody. We just shuffled off. He didn't seem to notice. I just tried to forget. I'm sure you were invited. I wasn't. It wasn't given to us. I'd have seen. I would have known. I might have been wrong. I don't think so. You get really sensitive. These things stick in your memory. He has had the odd birthday party. I'm on him the whole time. It's that fear of it going horribly wrong. Being on guard is really stressful. You end up feeling like a performing monkey. I need to be more an animated, more interesting, more appealing than my relaxed normal self. I want to appeal to all these kids. We're trying to be funny. We're trying to be entertaining. We're trying to be the most fun parents ever. Really cool and down with it. I want him to have a good time. I want him to make friends. It's all focused on him. If his friends have a good time, they're more likely to be willing to come again and be friends with him. Why did I come to autism? It ticked boxes every time. It's a really big thing. I would look for something else. Being a genius to me wasn't such a big thing. That's way more manageable. People can cope with that. Maybe that's the easier route. You think there's something, Everybody keeps telling me it's not autism. I'm looking for something. If it isn't autism, what is it? People just tell you, no, it's not that. He doesn't look like Rain Man. It's not passing. It's not passing. It doesn't pass. Because that's who he is. A relief. There is sadness. It all seems so extreme and limiting and difficult. They're not all fucking Rain Mans. His specialism, if he has one, is the fucking Titanic. That's not gonna take him far in life. I'm stunned by people's ignorance. How can I make, help make a life for this child? He's still your child, I can't do it for him. It's painful watching it. 
I try not to think too hard about it. It is quite overwhelming. I just don't want him to move out. I don't want him to be lonely. I don't want him not to have friends. I don't want him to hate every working day. I want him to find something that means he can be happy and fulfilled. What I'd take away is the violent part. I wouldn't necessarily take away all of the autism. Violence is the hardest thing. It restricts you so much. Some of the things, the quirky things, how he repeats things, he's like Peter Pan. This child who never grow up, that part of it is nice. It's almost like you've got a baby forever. That part of it I wouldn't want to take away. That's the nice part of it. The horrible part is horrible. If I could give him a pill that would stop that aggression, I'd give him the pill. I wouldn't necessarily completely cure him. He is who he is. He's unique. People say, if they told you he was autistic, would you have had an abortion? It's a difficult one. Now I wouldn't. Thinking back on a 20 year old me, that would scare the shit out of me. Oh my God, that's the end of the world. It's difficult. I would give him a pill to help him cure the bad bits, not the quirky bits. That's his personality. I'd probably get rid of my bad bits. He is who he is. You love him for who he is. You do hate him sometimes. He's horrible. Well, so horrible to me. I always think after somebody's been so horrible, if that was a stranger in the street, you'd hate them forever. You'd think you're the worst person. He does it to me all the time. Still, I love him. What is that about? It's the most bizarre thing. Because it's him, you forgive him. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. Just a quick snippet from this one. Uh, my life, as I knew it then ended, my new life began. It was literally like a door opened. I stepped through it, the door closed. I couldn't go back through the door. Then I was on the other side and that was it. That's where I was forever. It's like being in a prison cell. We are still in the prison cell. We can't ever come out. This is our life now. My compositions capture the stories the mother shared with me, bringing them to life. They helped me to reconnect with my data emotionally and physically and help me to make sense of their words. So this is a, oh, ethnography. So it's about how, how being, feeling and doing led to remembering as I was working on my PhD, <laughs> which if I could figure out how to move these slides along, I would. I have actually seen a laptop before. I swear to <laughs> God, this is not, die. You see, there we are. It's very complicated, which I think is probably the, uh, the correct title for everybody's PhD, but there we are. Um, so this research project it introduced me to the joy of autoethnography, and it provided me with the opportunity to learn and to practice it. Um, oh, there we are. So putting the theory into practice um, has enabled me to enjoy a methodology that is fully aligned with my natural research inclinations and to be enmeshed in the research. This in turn allowed me to think about, arrive at and discuss my own ideas on various aspects of the research. Yeah. As you're aware, a key element of autoethnography is reflexivity. As autoethnographers, we're co-creators. We co-create with our participants and we also co-create with our past and current selves as we decipher, untangle and make meaning of our data. This co-creation extends to reaching out to those whose stories we echo as we tell our own. There's a wonderful freedom in being able to present my authentic self in my research. I find tremendous joy in presenting my truth in my work, rather than having to pretend that my history doesn't exist or it doesn't impact on my interrogation and interpretation of the data. Writing my chapter on disclosure meant writing about my own early disclosures. And I was surprised when I found it upsetting. I have told my history so many times to people who didn't listen, um, then to Garthi, to lawyers, judges, former partners, to the media, my own children age appropriately, but somehow the writing of it affected me. In my mind's eye, I could see the bewildered 13 year old who was terrified of, her, of the consequences of her actions 
of speaking out, of telling. I could feel the rattle of her body as she wished she could reach back into the chilly morning and scoop the words back into her mouth and swallow them down, gulp them into her gullet, let them sink to the bottom of her belly, blackened and gnarled in on themselves. So in the course of this research, I realized something quite significant. The Italian mafia holds the Sicilian omerta in the highest regard. What they don't realize is that the ultimate in science control is actually the Irish wished. Omerta means you shall not speak of this outside the family. Wished means you shall not speak of this. Cunus. Oh, I see your Omerta, and I raise you his cunus, his quished, his glare of warning. Warning that whatever you say, say nothing when you talk about you know what? What did you think would happen? That the truth would set you free? And you would be what? Purged, cleansed, cleansed of all the horror, the invisible inky thumbprints that cover your every part. Part of you knows she knew, <laughs> she must have known. She allowed, condoned and permitted, permitted the soul murder of her own child, sacrificed you on the altar of her narcissism. Narcissism is so, so misunderstood. It's used glibly and the term is thrown around like snuff at a wake. Wake up. Save me. Make it stop. Listen, I have something to tell you. You don't, you do not. Easy now, easy. Whatever you say, say nothing. Cunus, how'd you wished? I wondered if my reaction to the writing up is on account of seeing myself in the company of other women and having a deeper awareness of my own deservingness of protection, care and love. Young Spiral comes into play here very much, I think. I was revisiting where I had been several times before, but at a different level of awareness. I was seeing myself as a child but less dispassionately than before. For the first time ever, I was able to acknowledge how utterly and completely all the adults in my life had failed me. While working on, it's very complicated, I experienced frequent lengthy periods of dissociation, such as I had not known for several years. This surprised me, oh, but not as much as the surfacing of more memories of abuse did. Through these memories, I gained access to parts of myself that I didn't know existed. I recovered memories that were upsetting and uncomfortable, but they were also gifts because they were additional pieces of the puzzle that is me. I have quite literally recovered during the doing of this work. To illustrate that, I have a brief excerpt from a video that I don't have time to show you, but I can send you the link. Um, um, what, what's quite interesting about this particular video is that it was recorded when I was in the middle of doing a piece to camera for a project on trauma aware, aware care. And in the middle of recording this piece, I had a flashback and the camera was still going. So I, in the back of my mind, we're all teachers, we can't help ourselves. I'm thinking, the camera's still running. This is going to be useful as a teaching tool because mm -hmm. I've had psychiatrists say to me, friend, you know, friends who are psychologists and psychiatrists say, what's the flashback like? Um, what does it feel yeah, like? I'll just do a, I'll do a write up on that. That's not it. That's not the voices in my head, okay? <laughs> just saying. I don't even sound like that when I talk to myself, I swear to God. Um, but again, that it, it's 11 minutes, but I, I had snipped three of it, and there's possibly a reason why, why I'm running out of time to, to share that. But um, bits of it were quite upsetting, and it took me months before I could look at it myself again. Um, but what was very interesting about this particular flashback was that for the first time ever, 
I was in it as my adult self, comforting my child self. So diving into this project, and there we are, diving into this project and submerging myself in the honest reality of it, I found so much compassion for the little girl who survived so much. In the middle of a flashback, the flashback I was talking about, I found the compassion to gently stroke her cheek and tell her that she did not deserve the brutality that was being visited upon her. I have seen her strength and I've been able to admire it. I have managed on occasion to regard her with a sense of awe, wonder, fascination and appreciation. I have undone some of the damage because I've been able to tell her that not only did she not deserve what happened to her then, but that now as a big girl, actually, let's be honest, as a very big girl, um, she deserves better. I have been able to hold myself in my mind's eye and in my heart, the child who cried herself to sleep every night because she knew that nobody loved her. I've been able to understand that she was right. Nobody did love her. And that is shocking. I've been able to see that like every other child, she deserved to have been loved. And somewhere in the doing of this autoethnographic study, I've realized that she is loved. Finally, because I have seen her and really seen her, I have learned to love her. On homing. Jackal line, starting, breaking, lost. Weaving into each other, trying to find each other. Lifelines, going, flowing, growing. Making and remaking, weaving and unweaving, broken threads made visible, tried momentums again and again. I chose to come to Scotland, not like my Vietnamese family to Germany out of life threat, but out of curiosity and inner urge. Why was it then so hard to leave amidst all the joy? My current research is about my family's migration, being in between cultures, and my grandmother through filming. It was instigated by a dream I had two years ago. It woke me up in the middle of the night in February 2021. I am in Scotland, organizing a gathering with my German family, my father's side. My mother calls with my grandmother and I my Vietnamese grandmother on the phone. She says she will take to the road with only a small leather pouch on her back, but wearing warm jumpers on her body. I am, we are astounded that she takes on the journey over 80 years old, all alone, on foot. I give her some destinations. My own travels to the gathering are through nature, green meadows and hills, until I come across a lake blue and tempting. I want to go swimming there. At the gathering, the atmosphere is bustling. We all have to film a lot of forms for COVID. My cousins are there, everyone's chatting away in German, going from person to person. Then the door opens and my grandmother and I comes in, exhausted, not wearing glasses. She looks for a seat, asks for a stool in her broken German, but nowhere there is a place for her, as if she didn't belong. No one recognizes her. I call, why, why, a day? Here, but she's drifting. The others don't seem to know that she is my grandmother, that she does belong to me, that she came all the way on her own. I go to her, I take her hands, rough and warm into mine, and guide her to a stool. Relieved, she sits down. Why, my day, I say again, so that she recognizes me, knows that she is at home with me. She hears me faintly, puts on enormous glasses, and finally recognizes. Tears start to run down her wrinkled cheeks, silently. She keeps my hands, I stroke her face beneath her eyes, her hair. 
I am also scared for her, so exposed here. I have to touch her. She leans her head against mine, and we hold our hands, an aisle of deep spiritual connection amid the worldly the bustling of my German relatives. Um, and then I followed her around with my camera in her small flat. Um, and I have a... Hey, thân thể mình lại quay rẻ lắm, mình cũng có biết quý trọng nó thì thật sự rất là ngon nhiều như vậy. Khi mà mình ngủ, cái tim mình vẫn đặt để mình thức dậy mình còn sống. Nếu mà mình ngủ cái tim mình nó không có đặt nữa đó, mình như vậy mình không có đi được, nó không đứng được. Thành ra mình phải biết ơn nó. Mà nói không nghe được không? Mình chỉ biết cảm ơn cái tim mình ngủ dậy, mình giờ ở đây mình chặt, cảm ơn cái tim nha. Trời ơi, tôi lâu nay tôi bạc đại, tôi không có biết, nhưng mà tôi sắp cái tim giờ tôi biết cảm ơn cái tim nhiều lắm tại vì nhờ cái tim mình còn sống tới bây giờ tôi rất là tạm tạ mình nghĩ nó có khổ giờ có khổ này mà tôi mới khổ được tôi sống được tôi cảm ơn mỗi một bộ phận mình mình phải biết cảm ơn còn mình là cái lực quê bay ra nhỏ ngoài vũ trụ có cái gì trong người mình có cái đó hết tôi biết cái đấy không ở ngoài có Kim Bọc chỉ quả thổ là có kim, có gỗ, có sắt, có nước, có lửa, năng tái thì con người cũng yên. Sewing directions. Place wrong side of fabric together. Cut out pattern pieces. 
A grinding noise comes from the machine, making me grimace. I think the tension is the issue, my mum declares. She's been fiddling with my sewing machine for the last five minutes, her expert hands tweaking settings and adjusting dials. Despite my frustration with the seized up Singer M320, I smile at the irony. Yep, tension's certainly a problem. <laughs> but the evidence isn't just in the uneven stitches in my attempt at making a shirt, <laughs> nor the sorry state of the unhappy sewing machine. No, the tension that I'm feeling has been sewn into every part of our interaction since last night, when we sat down together, me, my mum and my dad, to begin our reflexive chat about my autoethnographic writing the real reason for my visit. Last night, despite moments of faltering and blurting and needing to take a moment, the conversation flowed. So did the tears. But today the conversation is jammed up, just like my machine. I don't know what to say. In fact, I'm glad the machine's stuck. It's given us something to talk about, a problem to be solved, something practical and mundane, something safe. I watch mum's deft handling of the frozen machine, noticing how the locked threads seem unwilling to yield, even to her well-practiced fingers. I watch and have the sense that at any moment, everything will give way. I can feel a tugging in myself, a deep instinctive need to check our relationship, to check that we're okay, to check that my newfound honesty about my feelings hasn't completely broken everything. But I keep that need contained, locked in place. There'll be no slipping, no easing, no giving way. I'm resigned to the fact that I need to give mum time to step back from it all, to put it down, to walk away. But for me, it's excruciating. I can feel the panic tighten my chest, the sense of being stuck, making my skin itch. Unable to release the pieces from last night, they knot and tangle. Sewing directions. Mark fabric on wrong side, pin and snip, sew over the edge. I'm 17. I'm standing in the doorway to my parents' living room. My packed bags are in the hallway. Honesty about sex has brought me here. Mum has gathered the rest of the family. Dad is there, as are my five younger siblings. They sit on the sofas around the room. It's quiet, unusual in our family home. Mum is sitting nearest the door, between me and the rest of the family. I can see the tears in her eyes. They seem incongruous with her scowl. I've seen this contrast in her many times before, but never so stark. I've been told that I have a responsibility to explain to my little brothers and sisters, to tell them that I've broken all my promises to God and my parents and the bishop, and that I've sinned by having sex, which in the Mormon church is expressly forbidden outside of marriage and is considered as serious a sin as murder, to tell them that that's why I have to leave. I don't know what to say. My silence gets filled by mum. Your brother's leaving because he doesn't love us anymore, she spits. I look at her, but she doesn't look back. The words look like they leave an awful taste in her mouth. Saying them makes her tears well up, but I get the sense that it's still her anger that seems to be winning the battle inside of her. I know it's her truth that she's spoken, not mine. But part of me thinks that mum is right. I've destroyed our family, our eternal plan for happiness together. Being honest about my shameful sexual sin leads to the end of relationship, the end of everything. I go to the hallway, pick up my bags and leave. Mm. Sewing directions, sew pieces together, leaving minimal seam allowance, catch in raw edges. Mm. The sewing machine whirs again, bringing me back into the moment. I look at mum. She's smiling, the pride and satisfaction of having fixed the machine showing. That grin, playful and beaming and affectionate. That's what I see when I picture mum, hold her warmly in my mind. That beloved face, completely at odds with the one I described in the autoethnography that I read her last night. Oh God. I read her that last night, amongst other autoethnographic episodes. That beloved face, unrecognizable from the one full of hurt, awash with shame as she listened last night. In that moment, I watched her fade, sag, shrink. No defense, no angry response, just pain. She was all apology, despite my tearful assurances that apologies weren't the purpose of the writing, nor the reading, Making her feel sorry wasn't ever the intention. At least, 
I don't think so. Would I admit it if it were? Whilst I've been writing, it felt important to explore my own pain, my own sexual shame, and the effect it had had on my life, my ability to form trusting relationships, my fears about my sexuality and difference and queerness, my belief that I was monstrous and dangerous and would ruin everything. They all seemed good reasons to write, valid, justified. I hadn't set out to write about my experience of family, it was all supposed to be about counselling, about the taboo subject of erotic countertransference, about my ability to be a good therapist, about what it was like to honestly discuss this in clinical supervision. I didn't intend to unpick every sordid stitch in my story, not coming out, being outed, living a life of euphemism and avoidance and limitations on discussion. Or had I wanted this outlet all along? In that moment last night, looking at mum, it all just felt like a personal attack. As I sit looking at mum now, seemingly back to her usual cheery self, I can't help internally wincing as I consider the wound I delivered and the question of whether it had really been unintentional. I can't seem to focus on the conversations that followed about time passed, progress made, about how hard it is for us to really look at how we've hurt each other, but how much healing might come from it about how she never had a set of instructions. She was just trying the best she could to put it all together, to work towards her design for family. Alterations didn't come easily. Sewing instructions, trim edges, leave the underside exposed. Mum's overlocker has spun into action next to me. She's finishing the edges of one pattern piece while I stitch another. We sit facing the same direction, attention focused on the work in front of us. It's easier than looking at her. I can sense her presence, her physicality, the creak of her chair next to me. It's calming. There's also something reassuring in the familiar scent of her hand cream mixed with the smell of the machines. Is it the oil? Whatever it is, it smells like home. I want to trust it. The chattering machines pause, muted as we stop to position and pin. Silence is suspended between us. I find myself checking for tension in the moments of stillness. Does the silence sag or stretch? How does it fall? How does it drape? Is it smothering? I hold it up against me and inspect it, checking against our silences of the past. Will it rip suddenly, exposing, fraying? When the silence is finally cut by my mother, it's with the gentle care of a master seamstress. Calm and careful and assured leaving no jagged edges. So we'll carry on with our chat this evening. I want to make sure we get back to it, she offers. Her voice is clear and comforting. Mm. I dare to look from my work, from this garment that's half made. I look into her eyes. Mm. They are soft and caring. This is not the face from last night, nor the one from the writing. I don't have to ask if we're okay. I just hold her hand. She squeezes it. Even though I'm realizing more and more that I often find telling the truth dangerous, in this moment with mum, I feel safe. Thank you, um, thank you to all our speakers this morning um, for all the um, water ethnographic uh, stories. Um, I, I think we've got time for questions and comments. So um, I'd like to open it up to the floor for some comments. 